I am continuing my reading. What I'm doing in this series is to read through the entire standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This consists of the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. I am reading in a chronological order of events, not according to publication or volume, so I will be skipping around a bit as I move along. We continue now with Ezekiel. We're going to continue with Ezekiel until we have finished. Right now we're on chapter 43. So far in this section of Ezekiel, we started in chapter 40, and this has just been a very long and detailed description of the temple complex. So chapter 43. The glory of God fills the temple. His throne is there, and he promises to dwell in the midst of Israel forever. Ezekiel sees the altar and sets forth the ordinances thereof. Afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Kibar. And I fell upon my face, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up, and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me. So no longer describing the temple. This is God coming, I find it interesting that God is coming out of the east, because later on in the New Testament, it is said that God, when he returns at the second coming, he will, be, he will come as the sun, or the light, rises from the east. It's a very interesting parallel there. And he says that this is the same image, the same glory that he saw in his previous visions. But you also know that God, God doesn't come down from heaven and just appear in the temple. He enters by the gate. He comes from the east and enters in at the gate. Verse 7. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever, and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. In their setting of their threshold by my thresholds, and their post by my posts, and the wall between me and them, they have even defiled my holy name by the abominations that they have committed. Wherefore I have consumed them in mine anger. Now let them put away their whoredom, and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. This seems to be Christ talking, not the Father. He's coming back to his kingdom. Could be the Father, I don't know, but he gives me the impression that this is Christ. And he's saying, look, I'm going to dwell among my people, and they will no more be committing these abominations. They will honor me as they should. And that is why I'm coming back, because there is no more, there's no more wickedness there. Anyways, verse 10. Thou son of man, shew the house to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, shew them the form of the house, and the fashion thereof, and the goings out thereof, and the comings in thereof and all the forms thereof, and all the ordinances thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the laws thereof, and write it in their sight, that they may keep the whole form thereof, and all the ordinances thereof, and do them. This is the law of the house, upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof, round about, shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. I like this. I'm saying, show them the temple. Show them what you have seen, the layout of the temple. And if they humble themselves, if they become ashamed of their iniquity, of their wickedness, and they humble themselves, then show them the law and the ordinances and everything else. But you show them first the layout. You show them first what God is offering. And if they are accepting it, then you give them the details. Then you say, yes, okay, you can come in, and this is how things work here. This is what we do. You'll note also, it is upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof. Find that interesting as well. Verse 13. And these are the measures of the altar after the cubits. The cubit is a cubit and a hand breadth. Even the bottom shall be a cubit, and the breadth a cubit, and the border thereof, by the edge thereof, round about, shall be a span. And this shall be the higher place of the altar. And from the bottom, upon the ground, even to the lower settle, 
shall be two cubits, and the breadth one cubit, and from the lesser settle even to the greater settle shall be four cubits, and the breadth one cubit. So the altar shall be four cubits, and from the altar upward shall be four horns. And the altar shall be twelve cubits long, twelve broad, square, and the four squares thereof. And the settle shall be fourteen cubits long, and fourteen broad, and the four squares thereof. And the border about it shall be half a cubit, and the bottom thereof shall be a cubit about. And his stairs shall look toward the east. So again, yeah, the cubit and a hand is the cubit that they are using is a cubit and a hand breadth. A cubit is measured from the elbow to the tip of the fingers. That's a cubit. Standardized to be about between 18 and 20 inches. Usually 18 is what is generally considered a cubit today. A hand breadth is, again, 3 to 4 inches. It's going to be about that long. So that's the measurement here that we're using. That's one cubit. Now they also mention a span, and that is if you spread your fingers out, the span goes from the tip of the little finger to the tip of the thumb. A span of your hand. So you have the altar. The settle, it says in the footnotes, is a ledge or border, but I'm not sure exactly what that means. It, the way it's described, it gives me the impression that you have the altar and then you have underneath it kind of where the ashes will fall down to. That's where it settles. I don't know. I could be wrong, maybe it's just a border around the edge, but the main altar where you actually do the sacrifices is 12 cubits by 12 cubits. Now this is a, span, a cubit and a span, so we're talking about 21 inches. Remember the reed used in chapter 1 was about 10 and a half feet, and it was 6 cubits. So this is like 23 feet by 23 feet. That's a big altar. Continuing on, verse 18. And he said unto me, Son of man, thus saith the Lord God, These are the ordinances of the altar in the day when they shall make it, to offer burnt offerings thereon, and to sprinkle blood thereon. And thou shalt give to the priests, the Levites, that be of the seed of Zadok, which approach unto me, to minister unto me, saith the Lord God, a young bullock for the sin offering. And thou shalt take of the blood thereof, and put it on the four horns of it, and on the four corners of the settle, and upon the border round about. Thus shalt thou cleanse the pur and purge it. Thou shalt take the bullock also of the sin offering, and he shall burn it in the appointed place of the house without the sanctuary. And on the second day thou shalt offer a kid of the goats without blemish for a sin offering, and they shall cleanse the altar as they did cleanse it with the bullock. When thou hast made an end of cleansing it, thou shalt offer a young bullock without blemish, and a ram out of the flock without blemish. And thou shalt offer them before the Lord, and the priests shall cast salt upon them. And they shall offer them up for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Seven days shalt thou prepare, every day a goat for a sin offering. They shall also prepare a young bullock of a ram out of the flock without blemish. Seven days shall they purge the altar and purify it, and they shall consecrate themselves. And when these days are expired, it shall be that upon the eighth day, and so forward, the priests shall make your burnt offerings upon the altar and your peace offerings, and I will accept you, saith the Lord. This is kind of repeating the law of Moses here. You know, when they came out of Israel and they built the tabernacle and they had their altars and everything, they had to do an initial sacrifice to cleanse the altar, to sanctify it, to set it apart. This is the same thing here. So in the last days, this temple will be built up. God will once again dwell among his people and animal sacrifice will once again be instituted. I'm going to leave that here. And I'll see you in the next chapter.